Good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Zoe Ziegler. I am the VP of Brand and Advertising for Chase Sapphire. And I like to describe myself as someone who um, is a marketing advertising leader that's worked across categories from fashion to finance. So it's really exciting to be here with all these great speakers today. Uh, we have Richard Edelman, who needs no introduction, um, CEO of Edelman, a marketing and communications firm here in New York and in 60, 70 offices around the globe. And then we have Penry Price, who is um, the VP of Global Sales for LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. So thank you all for joining us here today to talk about brand purpose. Just by a show of hands, how many of you in this room have ever bought a product based on feeling good about what a brand stands for? Well. <laughs> And how many of you have stopped uh, patronizing a brand because of a stance that they've made um, around certain issues? So I think by the show of hands, it just shows how important brand purpose really is. And so we're really excited to dive into this conversation today. You know, audiences are paying attention to where brands stand on issues more than ever now, especially in today's, in today's climate, you know, whether it's political or the competitive cli climate, people are really paying attention to where brands stand on the issue and making um, decisions with their dollars based on that. Um, all of us as marketers here in this room, we understand that the root of um, what we are all working on for our companies is to really help them um, you know, be, be profitable. But there is a, a very clear connection to profitability and purpose. And that's what we want to dive into a little bit more here today. Um, before we dive into the, you know, exactly to the discussion around, around brand purpose. I really want to kind of level set on what brand purpose means um, for this discussion. I would love um, Penry and uh, Richard to, to weigh in because I think a lot of times the notion is that um, brand purpose really is something very um, heavy and you have to be like changing the world or you have to you know, be curing cancer and it's not always that that's that. So I would love to get your insight on really as we're speaking here today, what, what is brand purpose to you and the clients that you work with and how do they, how do they think of it? Um, thanks for coming everybody. <laughs> the crowd is like the new Avengers movie or something you thought you were coming to see. Um, I, I would, yeah, right. So, um, I think the, the notion of sort of brand purpose and sort of what a brand stand for certainly is important, but I think you've got to recognize that a company and a brand may actually be sort of two things, uh, and, and we've got to be careful to con conflate them. The company's mission, purpose, is to actually make money. I think we've got to remember that the profitability of a company, the growth of the company, is first and foremost what a company is sort of trying to achieve. When a company then can sort of understand what its mission and vision is to actually grow, you can start to then figure out the type, the type of sort of consciousness you have as a company for your employees, for your partners, for your um, you know, consumers to sort of understand what matters. And so to me, it's more of this notion that a company is just trying to grow. There's no company out there that is completely around purpose with just altruism as its sole focus. Um, but when you start to think about how a company then manifests itself in the market, that's when it starts to understand or should understand what it means to have a purpose and really about a conscious for uh, what they stand for and what they support. And so certainly it's become, as you were saying, Zoe, just because of the last handful of years, much more of an understood sort of tactic and strategy, but also a much understood uh, reason to sort of do this for the fact that many companies are being looked to to stand up and say what they believe in and be transparent about that for their consumers. So I think it's really moved from uh, cause-related marketing to purpose. And so if you go back to American Express supporting the renovation of the Statue of Liberty for the centennial of that installation, and you know that was cause-related marketing, and you put some part of the brand money towards renovation. Okay. But the Dove campaign for real beauty, going back a dozen years, uh, took on a serious issue, which is female self-image, and recognized a problem and made a commitment to actually changing their advertising, changing their messaging away from function and towards uh, uh, this broader idea of women being confident. And that has morphed now into, even for Dove men, where they're lobbying for paternity leave. So brands are becoming activist. 
the bar is raised beyond just um, talk, it's due, and it's significant because the competition is no longer Procter against Unilever, it's small brands, startup brands, you know, Bethany Frankel and Skinny Girl and, you know, all this, you know, and, and these are people who don't have any um, history and they make it up as they go and they have many times a social purpose and a cause. So it's a competitive aspect. It's also what works in social. Do you have something that is going to light up your community and, and make you something relevant as opposed to just trying to buy ads? People don't listen to ads. You can't get people. They actually block them or on Netflix or something else. So you better be relevant. And if you're relevant, you'll sell. And if you sell, you make money. I think the, the one thing you're saying too, I, I thought about Dove as well when I was thinking of brands that have done this really authentically on the sort of self-esteem side. The other thing that I think we all sort of uh, have to recognize is this is a company or a brand is actually just a collection of some number of people. And so to me, the sense of recognizing the sense of purpose is actually understanding as a group what is important to you. And so from a Dove standpoint, whoever it was, maybe working alongside you guys, um, they sort of figured out this is something actually we believe in. We're going to leave a mark on society in a different way. And so that is actually, to me, the brand purpose comes from a collection of people. Sometimes it's one person at a smaller startup who believes in something really uh, going for an impact in some way. Obviously, you can get to a large organization like Unilever where you've got to then have a collection of people who are truly committed to this notion of we're going to fight self-esteem. And it's not a campaign, let's be clear. I mean, you know, this whole let's, let's treat women better ad campaign that ran around the Super Bowl. I won't mention names. Um, uh, that was a campaign, and, and it didn't have a core of truth, and, and it was a quick one relationship. Be in for the long run. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I accept that. Yeah, and you, you hit on the competitive landscape, you hit on the social landscape, um, you know, even the war on talent and how, war for talent and how those are all very, you know, as we think about brand purpose, it's, it makes it even more important for us, for all companies now, to really show what they stand for because, you know, as, as a lot of us here probably have all made decisions about wh what company we're going to work on based on what we see on their, you know, the front page of their website about what they stand for and what they mean and, and, and in addition to what products they sell. So um, in today's climate, do you feel like you have seen changes in the brands that you've worked with and how, you know, the importance they place on really promoting um, their brand purpose and uh, defining and, and promoting their brand purpose in really authentic and, and, and relevant ways? I think it partly comes from the employees. Hear this, so Starbucks um, got rid of straws in their coffee cups, 100 million a day. And it's partly because the identity of the Starbucks barista and the employee group is tied to sustainability. And they want to lead, they don't want to follow. And so that's indicative of a different origin of purpose. Mm -hmm. It's from inside out. Mm -hmm. And I think the other you know, way outside in that Zoe's mentioning is how do you attract talent today, and we know, again, as we hear it all the time, the war on talent, hard to find great people. Uh, there's certainly great people out there, but there's certainly many, many opportunities as well. And so how do you actually stand out as an organization? Uh, and so attracting from the outside, certainly, as you said, the, maybe it's the landing page of their website, maybe it's a social media page, maybe it's a LinkedIn page profile, whatever it might be. Um, but actually putting your sort of authentic self forward, all the vulnerabilities as well as what you stand for, as well as successes, all sorts of things. Uh, I was looking again the last couple of days in preparation for this, and Netflix on uh, the LinkedIn Netflix corporate page, I don't know if anybody here is from Netflix, um, they do an amazing job of actually focusing on their culture from every aspect of what Netflix does, not just from the way we all probably interact with Netflix, but literally everything they do from their supply chain and everything else from technology engineers. So I went on that, and I was like blown away by all the different aspects of what I learned about what Netflix is like as, a, as an employer from the outside in. And so this is something, again, that I think all companies are starting to seriously consider, is how do I actually show up as an employer uh, to make sure that 
purpose matches with what I stand for as a person before I even uh, sort of think about applying for a job at any place. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's also a need for, um, you know, as we think about as we think about brand purpose, you know, there is a demand from customers as well to really, you know, patronize customers that patronize companies that um, who's who's who are being transparent, who are making what they stand for relevant. And um, Richard, I would really love for you to talk about the Edelman Trust Barometer a little mm -hmm. bit because you really have done a lot of work with your company to really help brands um, take a stand in that area. So it started 20 years ago We um, after the battle in Seattle with the NGOs uh, storming the meeting and saying globalization was terrible, started to study trust in organizations, and we were amazed that NGOs were the most trusted institution, business was down here, government was like equal, and over time what's happened is that business from the low in 2008 has become the most trusted institution. And that's a big change. On top of that, um, we for Can last year, did a study for um, trust in brands. And we found that, in fact, right after quality, price, ingredients comes, do I trust this brand? And people are buying on trust. And so it's, it's kind of brand democracy, this whole idea that I can actually express my views better by my purchases than I can every four years at the ballot box, that I have more influence on what happens in the world that way. And so I am going to do what all of you who raised your hand and say, I bought a brand on purpose or I got away from a brand that didn't have it. So, you know, when you evaluate a campaign like uh, Nike with Kaepernick, which is the obvious iconic one, um, you, you know, people initially were like, oh, sell the stock. It's going to be a disaster. Well, actually, no. It made it a agile, young, take a chance kind of brand that actually spoke up on behalf of society. And it was a really important issue, police violence and all this. Pretty ballsy move. Take the chance. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say after that. I mean, I think the notion of uh, you know the trust barometer that Edelman has put out, as he said, for 20 years, you know, this idea that should be scary to all of us is the lack of trust in so many parts of society. And so the fact that we're leaning on companies uh, and CEOs of companies to sort of be socially aware and be socially active can be a very strong message to society, but it's also potentially a dangerous one where we have this mix again of companies are trying to grow, remember? So I think we still have to balance if, if business is the leading voice in trust, there's still this recognition to me that companies are still trying to be profitable and grow, and so there may be some crossroads they come to, which is a, I've got to make a decision, and I'm already out there publicly about a, 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 uh, an issue that we or I or our team cares about, then, it's become, then it becomes very much transparent about what is the company going to do because we've actually seen what you think, and now how are you going to act? And that's where it feels like companies get in trouble. Yep. Yeah, and you, uh, Richard, worked with a lot of brands that really counseling them on how to articulate, deliver, and really amplify their brand purpose in meaningful ways that are relevant for their customers, their employees, and their consumer base. Um, can you, you identified a couple of different ways to, um, a couple steps that every brand really needs to keep in mind as they work on doing this authentically and um, relevantly. Can you kind of share a little bit about that? Well, again, first take a big public problem. So smoking, your CVS, you decide, let's get out of tobacco. No tobacco in stores or Walmart last week getting vaping products off the shelf. That is a short term revenue hit and profit hit but in terms of reputation, um, Zoom for both companies, point one. Point two, you have to figure a way that the brand somehow um, can evolve, that it's not a, a campaign, that it's a, a longer term uh, commitment. So JP Morgan uh, committing to rebuilding Detroit. That's a really smart idea because that's not going to be six months. That's 10 years. And then maybe try it in other cities. But push your clients to try things. Don't go for the big master coup right away. I think that's what a lesson for me. Small market, work it, make it happen. One of the things that we looked at, and I was just looking because the slide's up here, we, we recognized at LinkedIn that um, the idea, the mission really of LinkedIn is to create economic opportunity for everybody in the world's workforce, or the vision of the company really. Um, and in order to do that, as we dug through sort of how that manifests, how does that actually happen to create economic opportunity for everybody, 
you actually understand that nobody's in this alone. That really what LinkedIn has done, and other networks for that matter have done, is to connect people, in our case, in a professional environment, to sort of try to help them strive, help them move forward, help them achieve things that may be on their mind, that they're moving towards. And so the idea of In It Together is something that I think is about this notion of a purpose, too, that by building this network and by sort of facilitating these relationships in a productive way, you are enabling more people to be successful. And so many of you in the room probably have fairly large networks, right? 100 people, 500 people plus, whatever it might be. So the, the notion of what In It Together is also is for those people that are in Detroit or in underprivileged areas that don't have networks. The average number of connections on LinkedIn, anybody would guess, nobody, there's LinkedIn people, you're not allowed to guess, <laughs> two. Oh my. Two, globally, when you think about all of our 645 mm -hmm. million members. Think about how hard it is to network, to find your first job or to find a new job when you only have two connections. That to us is really strengthening our resolve to this idea of purpose for us as a company, is trying to find ways to accelerate other networks to connect to those networks or find ways for people without networks to be connected to those with larger networks that may help. But for us, that's a very easy manifestation of a purpose. It actually is very, it's the way the product works. And so for our work on this is really about those with little or no network, they're also in it together with us. And we're trying to find ways to build the products to enable everybody across the world, three billion plus from an economic standpoint or a population standpoint to find economic opportunity for them and change their lives. So I just wanna piggyback that. I urge all of you to buy a book called New Power. It's by Jeremy Hyman's. And it's all about how you take something like Giving Tuesday and you put it into the community and you let people play with it. And it might be different for the 92nd Street Y to a school, but the idea is owned by the movement. And it's not what most brands like to hear, but it is much more credible, it is much more um, a 10x, 100x kind of multiple kind of play. And it gives power to the crowd as opposed to keeping it here. And therefore is much more believable. And the book again was? New Power, Jeremy Hyman's. New Power, okay, great. Um, you, Penry, mentioned your campaign in it together, and it just makes me think about how you guys are really promoting your brand purpose through an, an, an advertising campaign. And we talked a little bit earlier about how companies are really, while brand purpose is important, we re really are here at the end of the day to, at, at the start of the day actually, to really make money and, and, and develop a profit for our companies, and sometimes, Promoting and communicating your brand purpose and promoting and communicating what your product is about and how that helps drive you know, bottom line KPIs can be separate initiatives. How have you seen your clients, um, have they connected the dots in you know, promoting it through one campaign? Are they taking you know, it from various swim lanes? I'm just very curious about that. It's, it's all, as you can imagine, it's all over the road. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's, there's the, I think finally we're recognizing in the larger community that your sort of employer brand or your talent brand, why somebody would come to want to work with you or for you, and your corporate brand, meaning what you stand for, are sort of one and the same. These now are sort of really becoming sort of one brand that you have as a public facing brand. And so we've had a long history now, many years going back, where that's been one of our sort of initiatives, is to make sure, sure that any kind of marketing message or any kind of communication to the audiences that matter for that brand actually is authentically about the employee experience and what the company stands for or connects to. And so that's one area, is we have lots of discussions about making sure this is a single authentic view. This is not two things at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. To your point, you know, there are moments in time where the sort of purpose or the consciousness of a brand or company is at odds with their ability for that quarter or for that year to grow. And I think to me, what you sort of then have to rely on is if you as a, remember it's a group of people that have committed to this purpose. If you've aligned to that, and if you've aligned to a vision and a mission, and you've actually sort of moved the army, that company, in that direction uh, to commit to the purpose or commit to that, uh, those goals and mission and vision, 
uh, you rarely will ever get caught making the wrong decision. You may still have a bad quarter, as Richard was saying before, with you might go down for a quarter, or you might go down for two, or even longer. But if you actually stay to the sort of committed mission and vision over the long time, which I think most of us will sort of say that we would support from a longer term growth strategy, mm -hmm. you're going to be on the right side of the decision. I also think it's absolutely essential that you consider if you're going to become a purpose brand, you're going to become a political brand, likely, and you're going to be facing more risk. And so you're Starbucks, and you've stuck your chin out about opportunity youth and mm -hmm. hiring kids in disadvantaged communities. And then something like Philadelphia happens, mm -hmm. and it's a shock. And the one option was to just settle with these two young men, apologize publicly, and say it'll never happen again. The answer that Starbucks gave was to close the stores and for half a day reconsider how their people were going to treat customers. And I would argue that that's what a purpose brand does. Um, and you better consider that when you go this direction because you're going to be in the limelight. And can you get management to move in that way when that stuff happens? And, and it will happen. It certainly will. And I think that's where, to me, it's that committed that everybody, especially at the executive level, has to be committed to that purpose. Mm -hmm. Because they are going to have to make these trade-off decisions. And if they've committed to that, they're going to actually end up making the right decision. That will, by codifying the mission and vision of what you're actually going, truly going after as a business and how you want to operate, mm -hmm. you'll always make the right decision in the long term. And I would also argue you as agency people should really look hard at who you work for and what clients they work on. Is it the time for you to be a client where, or at agencies who work for tobacco companies, or coal companies, or firearms companies? No, you should not work there. I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, and you probably need jobs, and like everybody needs jobs. And you could say, I run a family business, so I don't have to worry about it. But I do worry about it. I, 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 want, I want agencies to do that which makes the world better. Would you, would you, any clients of those come to see you lately to ask for help and would you say no or what would you? We said no and we have no interest. That's great. That's great. Um, as we think about brand purpose and the measurement of brand purpose, there are a variety of ways that some brands would go around about measuring it. The different brands that I've been at from a automotive company to a fashion company to now at J.P. Morgan Chase have all measured it in different ways. One did ad tracking where they aligned their brand purpose with their product and they um, really decided, really measured how that was helping to move brand consideration forward. Um, here at J.P. Morgan Chase, we do uh, monthly or quarterly um, reputation tracking with uh, you know some proprietary companies. Um, when I was at a fashion company, it was really about social sentiment and press. Um, pr press, the type, the type of press that the company was getting. So how have you seen your, your clients really nail in on how they're measuring and, and what that means for, for their business when, when they're speaking to their stakeholders? So we have a measurement uh, concept called net trust score. And we look at um, ability, dependability, integrity, and purpose. And we measure it across the universe of employees, customers, retailers, et cetera. And it's a damn good tool for deciding whether a purpose campaign, in fact, has, like Walmart getting out of uh, ammunition for AR, you know, what happens? Did it or didn't it work? And why and how? And is the CEO credible? So yeah, very tangible about trust. Over to you. I think the, uh, <clears throat> there, there's Certainly, I think that these frameworks that you have, and I'm sure there's others out there of sort of thinking about uh, the way to uh, measure this, uh, certainly important. Obviously, we're also going to have to be measuring the performance of the company. Mm -hmm. You know, am I growing? Do I have more customers today than I did? Do I have better partners than I did? Do I have, uh, you know, my, my sentiment, my online sentiment, whatever it might be? You know, what, what are the, again, the direction of these things going? And, and part of it is also, again, this recognition that this is a big, long time, this is a journey to be on. This doesn't happen in a quarter. So from a Walmart perspective, saying no to AR-15 ammunition and selling those, those weapons, you know, what happens? It could take a long time, but they're, again, committed to it. So I think the measurement of these things 
one of the critical pieces of it is the timeline with which you give yourself to measure actually the impact of this, of this campaign or this goal or this real commitment from the company because it's certainly, if you're attaching yourself, as Richard's saying, to some of these large societal issues, um, the payoff for all of us you know, could be many, many years down the road. And so it would be unfair from a company standpoint, I think, to start to measure in these short-term increments. Um, so I would say that those, the balance of sort of a trust or a, a reputation score, something that these guys would do with your own company metrics, your own company goals, but have potentially a longer time horizon would be where I would start to think about it. Yeah, and it's really important as brand marketers and as agency partners as well to educate us, us brand partners and our executive teams on how to look at the long <laughs> road yeah. a little bit more. You, you know, a lot of companies are so tied to quarterly, you know, results and that's their focus, but if we're really looking at brand purpose and really kind of establishing ourselves as a values-driven company, we really need to look at it from a longer a longer term That's right. point of view. Totally right. Yeah, yes, cool. Um, we want to open up the discussion for questions. So if you guys have any questions that you would like to um, put into the app, now is your time. I have a quick question that my app is not open. Do you mind if I just Yeah, go for it. Sure. back in the day, even a decade ago, this was not something that they were thinking about. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious, are they doing these things, a lot of brands, because they think this is what consumers now want? And is there a risk down the road for them going back to the way things were even 10 years ago? And I will, I will try to paraphrase that for those on, <laughs> on, on, on live stream, but really saying that given, given where brands are now today, there's a lot of brands stepping up and being values-based companies and promoting that in more compelling and, and, and clear ways. But that wasn't the case 10 years ago. And is there a risk for brands as they are you know, swinging the pendulum the other way as we move forward and really tapping into some of these issues that are going on in today's age, day and age and how that will impact their brand? I think this is a long cycle phenomenon. I don't think it's a two year thing. And the idea of brands stepping into the void left by government uh, is clear. Um, whether it's guns or whether it's LGBT, brands are leading. And the idea of the, 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 the gay pride parade and having all those corporate sponsors and brands, you know, JPM or Trojan, or that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. <laughs> It's impressive, and brands need to stay with it, uh, even if a Democrat's elected in, in, in 18 months. Um, it, it doesn't matter, um, because there's Bolsonaro, and there's Boris Johnson, and there's all sorts of characters um, all over the world. Brands need to keep doing this. I think it, it, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, is, it is about that void. That's what I was going to say. The 10 years, or whatever the right span of time is, certainly has been this void of nobody else has stepped in there, so business is being asked to. Business employs you know, millions of people, and so it's also staying relevant to what is on the mind of our employee bases, as well as our customers, consumers, whoever else. And so when you start to see this sort of momentum happening on some of these social issues that are not being responded to by other elected officials or whoever else, you know, it only makes sense that companies would sort of step in. As I said, it sort of makes it a little bit of a challenge because then you've got to really be authentic and you've got to commit to it and stay to it. The other thing to me is in 10 years, the last 10 years, <clears throat> think of the difference in the way we all have access to information. Yep. Incredibly different. This is incredibly different. Uh, the fact that in any real moment, we can know what happened anywhere in the world. You know, this, the Greta Thun Thunberg or Thunberg this week. Right, would we have all seen that? Like, would we have seen the lead up to what was happening in the UN without sort of this real time idea of access to information? Probably not. It might have gotten squelched. It might not have really ever showed up. Some channels might have showed it. Some might. So the idea of this access of information has also, I think, changed dramatically. And we'll probably never go backwards. So we're going to all have to understand that how do we act as a company? How do we act as a brand with the notion that? Everybody has all has access all the time to everything we say and do. 
Um, we have a question here from the app. If cultural trends drive purchases, then tapping those trends can drive economic values for, value for companies. Why should customers believe that brands really mean it? And I think that goes back to the idea of authenticity. And it's, it's not just about attaching yourself to attach your brand attaching itself to an issue when it's in the public limelight. It's about what is the long-term game that you guys have set up for how you're going, what you guys stand for and how you're going to um, communicate about it. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's what you do as opposed to what you say, mm -hmm. but I also believe it is how you communicate. Mm -hmm. So are you top-down? Is it an advertising-led, you know, we'll talk at you? Or is it talking to nano and micro influencers and having a discussion and briefing them and letting them take the discussion forward and letting your employees talk and letting key users of the product um, go out and advocate for it uh, and then show, in fact, progress on whatever goal it was, female self-image or, um, you know, frankly, good treatment of people in stores, <laughs> any of the above. Be measurable, be public about it, and disperse the power of the marketing. Don't make it from the top down like Moses with the tablets. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but a good example. Yes. <laughs> um, there's a question here about giving examples of brands that have tried to activate on their purpose, but um, may have taken some missteps, and instead of like necessarily uh, pointing out specific brands and bashing them. What are some tips that you would have or some, um, some tips that you would have to, to do this right and to um, <coughs> really take case studies into mind as, you, as you're doing Well, there? I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I do, I do think examples sometimes help people sort of so hopefully the, this company's not here. <laughs> but, but I also think they've done a good job after the fact. It was Pepsi with Black Lives Matter, with Kendall Jenner. Yeah. Um, it was so obvious that there was a disconnect around authenticity and sort of the whole storyline and then it became this whole meme of actually lots of uh, stories of how that take, took place. The good thing is, you know, Pepsi sort of has now understood this and has probably become much more aware than many companies of how this actually can happen in a split second with actually good intentions, right? It wasn't like they were doing this with to actually be called out as um, you know, sort of senseless and not being able to listen, understand what was really going on. So I do think that one is, at least in my mind recently, something that took over the sort of uh, narrative related to being sort of, sort of the flop, I guess the question here if they flopped. But, I, but I, so I go back to, you know, you've got to get a committed executive team. You've got to get a committed employee base. You've got to get people that are actually going to make those hard decisions and actually have a real understanding of why your company is committing to that issue, whatever it might be. And it can't be done just because it's a sort of thing in the moment. It has to be a reason why. Again, for us, it makes sense that we connect to helping people get jobs. It makes sense for people to think about employment opportunity when you're thinking about this platform. It's an easy one for us to really commit to. Uh, it's harder in other places. It's not as much of an understood sort of match, very uh, very easy match to an issue to what the company stands for or sells. Um, but to me, it's around commitment from the executives. It's around reput uh, repetition of that message, why it matters. And I would say, you know, one of the great quotes I ever sort of listened or heard, and I remember it all the time, think about it all the time, is repetition doesn't spoil the prayer. And so when you're thinking about a, a mission of a company or a vision of a company, the continued selling of that or telling of that story to the employees and partners and everybody else is, is the way this starts to really manifest itself and we then behave along the lines of those mission and visions. You know, there was a uh, letter circulated by an NGO called Every Town, um, which mm -hmm. has to do with gun safety. Mm -hmm. and. 150 CEOs signed that letter, including me, mm -hmm. and it asked for two things. One was that there be safe storage of guns, and two, that there be background checks. Minimum standard. And I spend about a quarter of my time in Chicago. Only two CEOs signed the letter out of 150 from Chicago. It was Coasts. And mm -hmm. I, I just would urge you to have the CEOs and your brands look around their local community and make that an important criteria and for what you pick, because companies in Chicago where there is a lot of gun violence need to stand up now, and brands need to stand up for Chicago and from Chicago. 
If you're Shinola, you should stand up from Detroit like this and, and take on these things because government isn't. And we need to have less gun violence. So there we are. I think it's a, it's a really good point because sometimes these things become a little bit of abstract. Like how do I as a, as a small startup or how do I even as a smaller company attach myself to some of these large societal issues? You don't have to. You can actually start very small in a community with your local neighborhood or whatever it might be. There could be you know, blood drives. It doesn't matter. There's just this notion of how do you start to connect with something that's important in the community. So um, Mars, uh, Skittles brand, um, was on uh, Trayvon Williams. Uh, Trayvon, yeah. and, and when, uh, Tray, Trayvon Martin, when he was killed in Florida, and there was a spike in sales. Every dollar more than the normal, Mars donated to gun safety and to mm -hmm. local community. Mm -hmm. That's how you do. That's great. Yeah, and there's a question here. Do brands drive culture? Do, do brands drive culture and purpose, or does culture and purpose drive brands? And I think that is uh, interesting with, with you know, the, the gun violence and, and gun safety matter and some of these other m major issues out there. Are brands really helping to push the agenda, or are they attaching to the agenda? What? I, I believe in brand democracy. I think that brands speak for me better than my vote. I don't get to vote enough. If but I did, but I, you buy a bunch of stuff. But I sure buy a lot, and I buy it often. And I buy stuff that I think is actually relevant to making it better. So... Yeah. yeah, and I would argue that people drive culture and brand because it's we're, we're the ones as consumers that are voting with our dollars, like you said, and are voting with the companies that we decide to attach ourselves to as employees. And so I really think that, and, and with you know social chatter and you know black Twitter and all those things, I really feel like pe people are driving culture. Um, so, great. Um, what advice uh, can we give on how brands can communicate their brand purpose? Is there certain channels that they should be focusing on? Do you focus on testimonials? Do you focus on influencers? Do you focus on your own channels? Should you be focusing on your you know, social channels on LinkedIn? What is the right, is, is there a right mix or does it, is it very individual to the type of brand that you are? I think it's, it should be entirely done on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, definitely the answer. Uh, no, I, I do think it's probably a mix for all brands, and again, it's around the authenticity of that communication. I think all channels are going to be helpful. I, I do think one sometimes underutilized channel is your employee base. And so how do you think about, you know, that, that day, if you all remember that day you received the offer to the job you're in, the first day you arrived, hopefully it was this like there's a package of like nice things and a t-shirt or your laptop is waiting for you. The sense of pride you had in that moment. You know, that to me is something companies don't harness enough about using your employees as a channel to share about the mission, the vision, and whatever else you love about the company. Um, so I certainly think about the social channels and traditional marketing and, and sort of the ways to uh, distribute our message and any message. But I, I really think quite often that, that companies are under leveraging their employee base because they're the ones that have such pride. They can be authentic about why they care. They can be authentic about to their networks or beyond. And so to me, it's one of the aspects of this that I think could be a best practice even is make sure you just put a, a column for employees. When you're thinking about all your other channels and all of your other tactics you're going to do related to that message, just add a column for employees. And what are you going to do for your employees to make sure you're not missing them as a powerful amplifier? I would also just reiterate the importance of being aligned with your celebrities when you take a purpose stand or some kind of stand. So one of our clients went on Trump's Manufacturing Council and was on CNBC and said Trump's a great asset for America and his spokesperson tweeted out, great asset, just leave off the ET. Um, <laughs> and you know that didn't last very long. Um, but the point is the um, celebrities have a lot more throw than the CEO in terms of brand purchase. Yeah. And that's why I think it's very mu it's very important now to have uh, celebrity partners versus just celebrity endorsers <laughs> to really make sure that the that, that the values of the, of the celebrities that we're working with um, you know align with that of the company as well. So uh, we're about at time. So I just want to thank everyone for coming today. I hope this was a discussion that you all got a lot out of, um, both in the room and on the live stream. And uh, thank you all. Enjoy Thanks the for rest coming. Of